Hello, this is Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt of the Christ School of Theology. You're looking at a series of lectures uh, that cover the period uh, from late medieval nominalism to the dawn of modern philosophy. Uh, we are moving very quickly through this material, uh, and I apologize for that, uh, but I can't do everything, so <laughs> it's not enough time, right? Uh, we're looking here at a period now after uh, Kepler. Um, we can make some general uh, uh, kind of generalizations here, general generalizations, good things to make, right? Uh, the early modern period, or the late medieval period, if you will, presupposes that, in fact, the world is intelligible. Hmm? Kepler thought it, Galileo thought it. Because the world is created by a benevolent and rational de deity, it is worthy of investigation. It is explicable, and because it is a product of the divine, that God stands over and against the world as its creation and not an, as an emanation from God, right? If you're Neoplatonic, this doesn't work, right? If you're too Neoplatonic, right, then the world is just an emanation of God and in some sense is God uh, under a transformation. It doesn't work here, but it does if you believe that God is separate from his creation. He creates, and because the world is separate from God, it can be investigated. It can be manipulated for scientific experiment. Now, much of this is continuous with the tradition, but we find that it specifically... Uh, becoming important at this time, right? I mean, you can go back, particularly in, in the late medieval uh, traditions, or even before that, at Oxford. Uh, some people like to point to Roger Bacon here as an early representative. So you can find these ideas. Uh, but here uh, we see it now coming to fruition. The early modern period works with a nominalistic framework. It rejects the notion of final causality, remember? Occam wants to let the air out of any bloated ontology, right? Do not multiply entities in vain, and if you can explain things without the category of final causality, well, please do so, and he did. Uh, the principle of sufficient reason is increasingly rejected because uh, uh, reason is thought not to be able to penetrate uh, into being able to find sufficient reasons why everything is what it is. Um, so this comes under attack. Principle of sufficient reason works nicely for Scotus, but not uh, as well with Occam. So what are some theological assumptions after Occam? Well, again, the existence and nature of God cannot be demonstrated. God has an absolute power uh, by which he can do anything and an ordinate power by which he wills this world to be. That's the distinction between the potentia dei absoluta and the potentia dei ordinata. The principle of sufficient reason fails because there is no explanation of why things are what they are. Why? Because God doesn't have to be reasonable. Right? <laughs> God just arbitrarily has... Uh, put the world in a particular way. It is the product of his will. There is no explanation of why things are what they are, save the mere arbitrariness and capriciousness of the divine will. Well, uh, if you're Thomas Aquinas, principle of sufficient reason works because, of course, uh, God is always going to do what is reasonable. The will of God is pulled along by the reason of God. But now if we have the will of God primary over the reason of God, well, reality can be any way that it happens to be. God just willed it a certain way, and why should human beings be able to penetrate into a reason why he did this? If we're going to try that, we might as well go back to Anselm, right? Cur Deus Homo. Knowledge of the divine can come only through revelation. So the correlative of this is that reality is contingent, right? <laughs> just as knowledge of the divine can come only through revelation, I can't reason to the world. It just, it just is there, whatever God wills. God's will is arbitrary. 
The reality he wills is contingent. Now, again, as I mentioned, because the created order is wholly other than the creator, this order can be investigated. It's perfectly fine to investigate it. It is created by God, and it is worthy of investigation. But because it is contingently created by a creative God, it is also likely to be governed by ordered relationships. So, even though we can't reason to why uh, things as they are as they are from the principle of sufficient reason, we would expect God's will to at least be consistent. And so, He wills uh, things, and then we can see how He's willing the world, if you will, uh, by looking at the regularities in the world. Now. We have a new science and a new philosophy. The new person, uh, now uh, coming up to the 17th century, is optimistic. He and she wants self-improvement. They want to be individuals, like humanism uh, talked of the individuals of antiquity. Science suggests that all things are made of matter, uh, coming in different shapes, having the properties of size, mass, and acceleration. And even though science knows this, we look in the world and we have an experience uh, of colors, orders, tastes, and sounds. Right? So now, as we move to uh, uh, particularly Thomas Hobbes and uh, into a subsequent thinking uh, in England, we have a distinction drawn between primary and secondary qualities. The primary qualities are the qualities things have in themselves. Uh, this is size, mass, and acceleration. Secondary qualities are how these things appear to us given our sensory organisms. No, organs. Yeah, sensory organs. So while there's just size and shape out in the world, we experience that perhaps as red or as blue. Right? So colors and odors and tastes and sounds become secondary qualities. They are caused by primary qualities. What is actually in the world are primary qualities. I always like to talk to my uh, introductory philosophy classes about how there are no colors in the world. And of course, oftentimes, uh, people, uh, young women particularly, like to think of colors being in the world, right? Uh, but of course, there's no green. All there are is, you know, electrons. There are various particles uh, doing particular things according to laws out in the world, and uh, that uh, is experienced by us as a, you know, a beautiful a green uh, mountain meadow, the luscious verdure. Qualities then are merely subjective, quantities objective, right? Bodies must conform to mechanistic laws because bodies are part of everything. But then how is human freedom possible? How is human freedom possible in a world of determinism? So posterity is left with this choice here coming into the 17th century. Are there really only objective things? We might call this a materialistic monism. Or is there a realm of value as well? And if there is a realm of value and a realm of matter, a realm of matter, value, right? Uh, we would have a dualism, but if we had a dualism, how could they possibly hook up? How could matter so very much different than value or mind, possibly connect to mind or matter. We'll talk about this much more uh, in future lectures. And then where is God in a materialistic, monistic universe? What's he up to there? And then what would be he be up to in a dualistic universe? One of the thinkers uh, we find, and actually more than one, uh, claim that God really is, you know, involved here in trying to bring together the matter and mind in a way uh, that makes uh, sense of things, that's 
that's consistent and consonant. So, so much to talk about and so little time to do it. We'll come back next time. We'll start talking about uh, Descartes and then we'll talk about some of the great philosophers uh, that change forever how we look at the world. This is Dr. Dennis Bielfeldt of the Christ School of Theology. Thanks for joining me today. Mm -hmm.